Good morning to everybody. I'll be talking about interpreting and translating as a career option for language enthusiasts. I'll try to keep it short so that you have enough time to ask me any questions that you want to ask. I just uh, heard like yesterday and this morning that there are many more uh, other interpreters and translators out there. How many are there? Okay, even more than I thought. Good. <laughs> Uh, all interpreters and or translators? Okay, there you go. So first a short introduction about my personal background. I'm Austrian. I grew up in a monolingual environment, so you don't have to be bilingual, you don't have to be multilingual when you start out. And uh, you should be able to speak a few languages afterwards, of course before you start uh, doing the job. Uh, I am a language enthusiast. I have been one ever since I can remember, even when I was a child. Uh, I loved languages at school. I didn't always like the way languages were taught to me, but I loved using them. And uh, some might say that I abuse them. I'm abusing them sometimes. Not really manipulating them, I guess. Uh, I've had 20 years experience as a translator and interpreter. There are quite a few people out there who do either translating or interpreting. And you can also go for both. These are two different professions that also require different skills. I'll try to talk about that later on. Uh, my education, professional training, I went to elementary school, to high school. It was some sort of a commercial type of high school. Uh, for all the Austrians out there, it was a Handelsakademie. And not really the kind of school uh, where you learn a lot of uh, languages. So when I went to university, everybody was surprised that I actually came from one of those Handelsakademien because it is more a school for business people or for people who would like to study business at university. My hobbies, languages, no big surprise there. Traveling, which is also good because as an interpreter, you will travel quite a bit depending on where you actually are located. You could also work as an interpreter for a company and then you would probably just be in one location or in different locations if you work for a company that has some branches abroad or whatever. It really depends on your individual working environment. I love reading, which is also good because uh, you need to deal with the language in all its aspects, I think. Uh, not only when you study the language, but also when you use it. So I do a lot of reading in all my working languages and also in the languages that I study just for a hobby. And uh, I also love hiking. So that's good because it's a good way to relax. Uh, differences between interpreting and translating. Uh, a lot of people use the term to translate when they refer to interpreting as well. And basically, I mean, I don't mind personally, but there are quite a lot of colleagues out there who would say, no, 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 I'm not a translator, I'm an interpreter. And uh, there is a difference as regards uh, what you have to do. So interpreting means that you try to render, try, Caroline, no, I do render a text uh, <laughs> uh, from a source language into a target language. Uh, translating means that you render a written text from a source language into a target language. Uh, the difference also regards the way you prepare for an assignment. If you go to a conference, you need to do a lot of preparatory work. You need to read documents if you get documents uh, from the speakers, which is not always the case. But today, for example, you can go online, you can try to Google the speakers to find out more about their professional background, have they published any books. Uh, and you can also try to get some more additional information about the topic that they have chosen for their presentation. Uh, with translating, uh, you can use, and in many cases you will have to use a lot of dictionaries, also parallel texts, which very often is even the better option. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows what, what I mean by parallel text. It just means that, for example, if I have to translate let's say like a technical description from English into German, I try to find a text that was originally written in German and dealing with that specific topic. So it's not a translation, but it is a text that was actually written by a technical writer, for example, right? So I can be sure that I'm using a term that is not just in a dictionary that was published 10 years ago, but that I'm using a term that is current. Uh, 
you use reference books, and as technical tools, you can also use translation memories. A translation memory is not uh, a machine translation. It just stores and uh, remembers your translations. It's a software that you can use. There are different brands for that. And it's very good to maintain a consistency in the way you translate certain texts, which is especially important if you translate like I mean, it's important for any type of text, but very useful for technical documentations, for example. I mostly work in the legal field. I'm not using translation memories that often because every lawyer is very specific <laughs> and uh, their texts are very specific and the way uh, they formulate things is also very peculiar. So uh, I prefer not using too many uh, translation memories with this kind of translation, but everybody is different. So if it works fine for you, you can use it. It can be very useful. Uh, what are the differences as regards the working conditions? So a translator can work from home or any other place. The only thing you need is an internet connection. When I started out about 20 years ago, I had a hard time to find all the dictionaries I needed. And I ha now I think I have about 150 dictionaries, but I stopped buying dictionaries, like in book form, uh, I'd say about seven or eight years ago. Now I have about 55 or so dictionaries on my notebook. So basically, my office is my notebook. So I could just go anywhere where I have an internet connection, work from there. And um, the only thing you have to do is that, of course, you have to meet the deadline that is set by your client. But other than that, you can freely organize uh, your daily schedule. Your client doesn't care whether you get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, whether you wear a suit or a tie, whether you're working in your morning gown. He doesn't see you anyway. And uh, the only thing he cares about is that he gets the translation by the time he needs it. And he wants to have a certain quality. Uh, what I don't like about translating is that you have... Uh, uh, all right. Uh, you have to type a lot, of course. I mean, there are some uh, colleagues uh, that use software, a speech recognition software, but afterwards they have to do a lot of editing. So I'm not using that. Uh, it's hard uh, on, on certain parts of your body. If you have to sit a lot, or you can get back pain. I had a slip disc, like I think it slipped three or four times. This is when I realized I really need a new table, a desk, uh, a desktop that I could actually adjust so I can sit for 20 minutes and then stand up for 20 minutes, and that has helped me a lot. Uh, Tender vaginitis is also a problem sometimes if you have to do a lot of typing. Interpreters uh, have to be where the conference takes place, of course, unless you're using, uh, you know, like you're working at a phone conference or something like that. You do a lot of sitting. Again, this could be a problem. It was a problem for me. It is actually still a problem. So if I have to work for five days in a row, I got to make sure that every evening after I've worked, I do some, it's not really workout, but some gymnastics or whatever, or I take a hot bath. Because if you have to sit for eight hours, and sometimes you really have to sit through these eight hours, because uh, you have to assist your colleague, you're always in a pair in a booth, and uh, this can really take and will take a toll on your body as well. So doing some physical exercise is also very important. Then you have a dress code. Uh, you are supposed to wear a suit, to wear a tie. So this is the first, the first time for me that I'm at a conference and not wearing a tie, not wearing a suit, which is very nice. And it's also the first time that I'm actually on the other side. So normally I'm somewhere back there looking at a speaker, probably not being very happy with the way he is doing his presentation. I'm glad I don't have to integrate <laughs> myself right now. <laughs> what are the specific challenges? Translators have very irregular working times. Uh, tomorrow's a holiday, you think you don't have to work? No way. Your client wants that uh, by the day after the holiday. He goes on a holiday, but he wants a translation 8 o'clock first thing in the morning. So you can't really say, I have like a nine to five job, right? It's still your decision if you work on a freelance basis. I'm a freelancer, by the way. Uh, but if you don't try to accommodate your client to a certain extent, of course, you will try to find somebody else. Uh, time pressure, short delivery terms. That's something that uh, is getting more and more difficult. Like before I came here, I was at two conferences. And uh, during the break at the conference where I was interpreting, I got a call from a client 
or somebody working for, a, for, uh, for an Austrian ministry. They had a press conference uh, scheduled and they said, okay, we need these two pages within the next hour, which basically is impossible if it's a very complicated legal text. It was about some EU regulations. There is an Austrian lady who seems to have uh, certain problems with certain EU regulations and uh, the way she interprets them. So there was a little conflict between Austria and some other EU members and they had a press conference on that and they wanted uh, me to translate parts of uh, that press release. So what I did is that I said, okay, I can do that, but you have to have somebody who proofreads that. I'm not going to let that go out with my name under it. I mean, they're not going to put your name in it anyway. Uh, but uh, you will take the blame if anything goes wrong. I said, okay, I do that because they actually literally backed me to do that. But you will have to have somebody who is an expert because I cannot do the research within an hour. You know, I know some EU regulations. I don't know all the names and all the documents and I cannot do that uh, that quickly. So you have to make sure that you can uh, work in an environment that allows for you to provide your client with high quality service. No matter how much they beg you to do a job, once it's done and it's poorly done, you are the one that they are going to blame for it. Nobody's going to tell you afterwards, oh yeah, I know I understand because we really pushed you to do it. They don't care. They have a product, they are not happy with it, they are going to blame you. Okay, interpreter, highly stressful working environment. Not today for me. So uh, you have different accents of people, native speakers, so you need to tune your ear to the different accents. Uh, you know, there are people out there that say, oh, so you're not speaking with a British accent, whatever that is supposed to be, because there are many different accents anyway. Uh, so your English is not proper for this kind of conference or whatever. You will be uh, confronted with many, many different accents, believe me. Uh, even amongst colleagues, I remember that I used to work with a young, very charming Irish colleague, and she spoke perfectly comprehensible English, like for a foreigner, like me. But when she got uh, like nervous, she would fall back into what I would consider a very strong Irish accent, which sometimes for me is difficult to understand if it's about a very complicated uh, topic. And she was in a so-called relay booth, which means somebody was talking, I think it was Russian. I don't do Russian into whatever language. Uh, so I needed her to do it for me and for all the others in the other booth into English first. So I uh, took her English version and went into, I think it was German, and the other ones went into French, Spanish, Cantonese, whatever. And whenever she got nervous, you know, she would like fall back into that Irish accent. And I, I was next to her booth, so I would actually <laughs> knock on her like window. Uh, and <laughs> not knocking her up though, that's uh, by the way one thing, uh, no, 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 no. that's one thing that happened to me, for example, talking about different accents, talking about uh, different usage uh, for expressions, because actually there was an American speaker once who was talking about uh, having been at a conference and, and being late because he was not knocked up in time. So there are differences in usage as well, uh, which can be kind of embarrassing if you don't know if it's a joke or if he actually meant it. Uh, so types of interpreting, simultaneous interpreting, you always work in the booth, not always, but most of the time. It's rather anonymous. People will not see you most of the time, which is also good if you do a really poor job. You don't want anybody to see your face. Uh, you always work in pairs, which is great. I love that. I definitely prefer simultaneous interpreting over consecutive interpreting. Uh, you always have somebody you can share your grief with, right? And uh, we also have in the booth uh, like a console uh, and uh, we have a cough button. And most of the time I call it like the curse button. Uh, when I go like, what the hell is that person saying, and you have to do it with a smile because people might actually look at you while you say that. And uh, well, you normally switch after 20 and 25 minutes, sometimes 30, 40 minutes. I used to do that when I was a lot younger, and now I try to make sure that I compliment my colleague uh, long enough for her or him to take over even earlier. 
And uh, consecutive interpreting, as I said, is something that you do mostly alone. I think this is the most challenging type of interpreting. Uh, like, uh, you have somebody speak uh, a few sentences, ideally, sometimes they speak for five minutes, and they actually expect you to remember what they said. And uh, you can take notes, some colleagues do, others don't. And the problem with taking notes, at least for me, is that you always have to decide, are you going to take the notes in the target language, that is the language that you work into, or in the source language? Should I do it in both? Will I remember which language I will have to interpret into if I read like, okay, that's English, that's German. Maybe I have some really weird figures that I try to draw. And uh, we develop a certain technique for that. So there is a note-taking technique. You cannot write out entire sentences. So if somebody says that the economic development took a downturn or whatever, you just draw an error that is going down. Something good, like that could be like, uh, well, I've gained weight if you were very slim before, so the error goes up because it might be good for you, whatever. A development is uh, mostly just an error like this. And, uh, you know, like just a circle could be uh, humans or it could be a conference or whatever. It is what you make it, right? You have to develop your own techniques for that. <coughs> Uh, consecutive interpreting is mostly used for news conferences, negotiations, and so on and so forth. Uh, you have a direct contact with the client, you get a lot more feedback. In most cases, fortunately, it is positive and good feedback. People realize what you're doing for them. If you sit back there in the booth, nobody realizes who you are. They just hear your voice. Uh, I was at an EU conference where the guys actually said, oh, I think we have to have a break. Our translating facilities seem to be tired. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, like response that you get if they don't really see you, right? Facility. Uh, yeah, the facility had a technical breakdown after that. So, whispering interpreting is another form. Uh, basically, it is simultaneous in, uh, translation under more severe conditions. Uh, you don't have any technical equipment. You're supposed to sit next, behind, or whatever, but not on top of who you're going to uh, interpret for, and you have to whisper, which uh, puts a lot of strain on your vocal cords. If you have to do that for eight hours in a row, believe me, uh, it's terrible. Besides, you always got to make sure that you brush your teeth in the morning, because you're very, very close to the people. Uh, and it's not always well received by the other people who don't need the interpreting. They feel disturbed by it. So the person you're going to work for is going to say, I can't hear you, can you speak louder? And the other one say, shh, 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 you're disturbing us. So uh, I don't like that working environment too much either. This is our, uh, what an interpreting booth looks like from the inside. It looks a little different once we're done with the job. So, a lot of paper, a lot of chocolate, paper in my case. Uh, and uh, so you see, there is room enough, not really, but there are like two places, right, for two people. It's small uh, booths, if they're mobile booths, some call them rabbit cages. Uh, if you've ever been there, you know why. Uh, not only because they're not really spacious, if you work there in summer for eight hours with no air conditioning, they don't only look like rabbit cages, they smell like rabbit cages. <laughs> uh, this is a built-in interpreting booth that's much nicer. So you have much more room, and sometimes when you work uh, like for international organizations, they make it easier for us because we can see them, but they can't see us. Mm. Is this all going on record? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, 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 Because okay. sometimes when I feel a little tired, or when I don't feel that challenged, I might actually switch position, lie down, not sleeping, still working, but trying to do some exercises or whatever. Uh, good, so this is what an interpreting console looks like. There are different types, so a Bosch is just one brand. Uh, there are others. Uh, this is the mute button, uh, the cough button or whatever, a curse mm -hmm. button. And uh, this is where I have to switch on your microphone. This is uh, the floor, the auto relay. This is A and B. This is the language that you, languages that you will have to work into. In my case, for example, it would be German, English. These buttons are all for possible or potential relay languages, right? So let's say there is Cantonese, there is Russian, there is uh, Japanese. 
and to, I have to work into German. I don't work in any of these languages, so I need a relay in English. So I just click on that, and I get the English from the Japanese guy, or uh, interpreter. Oh. I, I click on that, I get uh, the Russian, uh, or the English from the Russian guy, from the Russian booth, right? And then I go from this English version into all the other versions, which is great if the person in the relay booth knows what he or she is doing, <laughs> which is not always the case. We had an international conference, like 20 languages, two very charming, very nice young Korean colleagues. Uh, I couldn't really communicate with them, which I found surprising because they were s supposed to deliver me with their English relay. Uh, so I thought, okay, maybe there is another relay, which sometimes happens. Uh, so everybody, I was in the Spanish booth, everybody waiting for them to start. I saw them talking, kind of talking to each other, and, and I couldn't hear anything. So everybody was waiting for the relay. I saw the Chinese booth and whatever were also waiting. Uh, and uh, then I thought, okay, they are talking. I must have made a mistake. I'm not very good with technical things. So I was immediately blaming myself and made one of the biggest mistakes. I never told my colleagues about that, that I was the one who did that. Uh, but I trust they are not watching this. <laughs> what I did is that I was on a certain channel and I went like, oh, I must be on the wrong channel. I can hear them. Oh, I made a mistake again. And I switched. And I pushed all the others to another channel too. So all of a sudden, the guys who had listened before in the audience to the Chinese uh, version, they heard my Russian colleagues. And the other ones heard like the Japanese colleagues. And I went like, oops, I still don't hear any English here. Uh, the thing is that the technician came into the booth and said, what have you done? I didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. Uh, I haven't touched anything. I'm in the English booth, uh, a German or a Spanish booth, but I don't hear any English. The thing is, uh, the two young colleagues had never done any simultaneous interpretation. What they did was that they were arguing the booth who would start. And then they said, the microscope is not working. And then I went like, OK. Uh, <laughs> So, what we did is we had a total technical breakdown failure, and we had, uh, I think it, it was a member of that international organization who actually spoke some Korean, and uh, he did some consecutive interpreting, and we took it from there. Good. Uh, happened only once, but it almost killed me. Uh, this is what it looks like when you have more booths for a conference. So, not a lot of space, but you get very close to your colleagues, so you can bond, which can also be nice. This is what it looks like if it's just one booth. Uh, this is consecutive interpreting, or an example of consecutive interpreting. You can see that a colleague is holding a notepad, and now she's very uh, concentrated and focused. This is what all of us look like. I had like uh, a picture like that with uh, some football player once and I took it off my site immediately because it's just terrible the way you look uh, when you really try to uh, and just not try when you understand people. <laughs> <laughs> so types of translations uh, because I work as a translator as well you have literary translations <laughs> Very, very challenging. I have no idea whatsoever why these people are so poorly paid. They are like on the top of the top. And uh, they mostly get paid per page sometimes. They can get a deal with royalties, which is great if you translated Harry Potter or something like that. I do legal, medical, technical translations, mostly legal now. I, I used to work for the European Patent Office for about 15 years. I mostly did biomedical uh, uh, patents. I mean, I didn't do the patents of translations, which was just as bad. And uh, now I focus on legal translations, and uh, the pay is quite good. Necessary skills and training, of course, you need to have an excellent knowledge of your working languages, which doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. Nobody is perfect. I make mistakes in all my languages. I make mistakes in my native tongue. And, and you have to train your native tongue as well. This is actually uh, one thing that's quite surprising. Most of the students fail at the exams when they have to work into their language, into the native tongue. It's the same when they uh, take exams for the European Union or for other international organizations. So you, you get a lot of, your German is not good enough, even though you're a German or Austrian. Stress resistant. Team spirit, uh, whether you work as a translator or as an interpreter. If you work as a translator on a large project, you will have to work with other people as well. So you need to be a, a nice guy, I guess. <laughs> Open-minded, 
Emotional stability. Now that sounds like, uh, am I going nuts or what? Sometimes I am, as a matter of fact, but for various reasons. Uh, you have to be emotionally stable because sometimes you work under really difficult conditions. And I've had moments that were really difficult for me. I, there was a conference where after two days I said, I can't do that anymore. I'm afraid you have to find somebody else. Uh, there are people who say, if you're an interpreter, you are just a facilitator of communications. You're just neutral. I can do that. I try to convey emotions, but that takes a toll on you. If you have people talking about some terrible experiences for two days, um, you need to learn how to deal with that. Uh, you have like crime victims, terminally ill patients. You're the one looking them into the eye and telling them that they are going to die which is very hard because the people are sometimes don't even realize anymore that you are not a doctor and that you are not the cause of their disease. So the reactions you get are very spontaneous. People cry, people hug you, people hit you. Uh, that happened to me once as well. Uh, when I was working uh, for the alien police, you know, like you have to tell people that, you know, people... Uh, applying for asylum and, and of course they try to interrogate them for hours and hours repeating the same questions over and over again and then all of a sudden the guy says why do you keep asking me the same questions it's not me it's the other guy right <laughs> uh, said, i told you i told you what my name is so you don't believe me i do but he doesn't uh, 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 that was kind of hard <laughs> So uh, you have to be ready for lifelong learning. You can never say, that's it, I'm done, okay? Uh, whether it's linguistically or mm, on a more personal ba basis, right? Uh, as for the training, this is a non-regulated job. What does this mean? Anybody, anybody here could go out there, have their business cards printed, and it says, simultaneous interpreter. You could try to get jobs, it would be totally legal, at least in Austria, Germany, and many other countries I know. You need no certificate whatsoever. You don't need it, but it's a very good idea to get one and to get proper training as well. Uh, mostly it's public or private universities that offer this kind of courses. You don't have to go to an elite university. There are some, I'm not going to mention the names, that are going to charge you an enormous amount of money. I went to a very small, rather unknown university, and I still learned how to interpret. What is a good idea is, to find out if the university is part of um, the international association or is a university that is recommended by the International Association of Interpreters, uh, IEQ, because that could actually help you to get jobs later on, or at least uh, you have an idea what kind of curriculum they have. You have to be aware of cultural differences, very important. Sometimes you're much more than just translating, interpreting, especially with consecutive interpreting. Sometimes it actually happens that people ask you, what should I do? I had like negotiations with uh, an Austrian company going down to Italy. They wanted to build uh, some accommodations for the uh, American army, right? And so the Americans have a different approach when it comes to negotiating, and Austrians have a very, very different one. And uh, so at a certain point of time, the Americans just uh, said, okay, we'll leave and we come back after 10 minutes. You tell us a new prize and we'll see what happens. So everybody was like, how, oh, wow, uh, we just talked about this for two hours and all of a sudden they just leave. So the Americans went out and everybody went like, what are we going to do? What should we do? What should we do? And I went like, I don't know. You know, it's, <laughs> that's kind of weird, so. I can't possibly ask them out or whatever. Well, I could, but I didn't want to. Uh, Crohn's normally are not in my age range, so. Expertise in the subject matter and or close cooperation with experts of a specific field. That's very important as well. You cannot be an expert in, any, in, in all the fields, and you have to be honest enough to say, I can't do that job, because nothing will hurt you more than a poorly done job. If you failed once, people will remember that. And to, this is the best thing that you can do to yourself. Say no at the right, at the right moment. And to try to uh, yeah, get experts to help you out. Working environment and career outlook. Uh, freelancer, you can work for agencies, direct clients. The difference is that agencies will uh, 
charge a certain fee, of course, for the service, which is okay. I work mostly for agencies because it gives me more liberty. It's easier to just deal with one secretary than with uh, the secretaries of many, many different direct clients. Uh, you could be employed in translation agencies and private companies working for international organizations. Payment. Uh, it really, really varies a lot from country to country. In Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Liechtenstein, very decent pay, very good pay in most cases. Uh, in many other countries, I don't think you could actually live uh, on what you earn. I don't know, but I'm, our Spanish colleague will be able to say more about that, maybe. But the rates in, in Spain, Italy, France are a lot lower, even in the United Kingdom and in, in the US. I don't know why. Maybe they just don't appreciate the kind of work or I have no idea, but it's in the German-speaking countries, or if you work with German, inter-German, you will get the highest rates. Uh, in Austria, and in most cases also in Germany, we charge per standard line, which is composed of normally 55 characters, including our spaces. <laughs> and uh, in many other countries, it's per word, per hundred words, per thousand words. In Austria, we work based <coughs> on the target text, so once my translation is finished, in many other countries, they take the source text. Per word is very bad if you work into German because we have long words. So if I ever said yes to that, I made sure that I found a way around like deconstructing my sentence. Uh, interpreter, half day rates, full day rates. Half day up to four hours, including breaks. Full day up to eight hours. In addition to that, you have like overtime. Uh, you get all the uh, travel expenses. You get food and accommodation according to AIC, uh, if I remember correctly, it's always at least a four-star hotel. Uh, which is nice, especially if you stay in places like Dubai, when you only have to work like for three hours in the morning, and then you, you know, they take you on some safari or wherever. It's nice. It is, it is. Oh, they take you back too, don't worry, so they won't leave you out there. Court interpreters, very, very challenging. I used to do that for a few years. I'm not a sworn in interpreter. Uh, there are many who are, and they are on a list, but sometimes, you know, like, they catch a criminal, and they just don't find a court interpreter in time. So they call other people like me and say, would you like to do that? I don't like to do it, but I will. So I went there, and uh, you can be sworn in ad hoc for that specific trial. Uh, very, very stressful. It's not like in the movies where everybody's very nice to each other. Uh, and, uh, okay, no, I, I'm not going to say that. But, <laughs> no, it's just like, I, there is, uh, I watch a lot of American soap operas and whatever, and some uh, court shows, and they translate them, they dub them into German, and it's Germans who do that and they call their judges, uh, okay, which one is it? No, 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 because I used the wrong one. Ah, uh, euer Ehren, euer Ehren. Okay, to me that was quite formal, good, and I addressed our Austrian judge with that. And he almost killed me, and he went like, oh, another one of these guys who only watches those dumbly dubbed American movies. <laughs> so Austrians, euer Rat, and not euer Ehren. And I'm like, oh my God. But how many years will I get? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I managed to get the guy free, though. No, no, no. no. I, I didn't do that. It's just like, it, it was his lawyer. I was just translating. Yeah, was just translating so. so, the current market situation, future prospects. It's so weird. Every time I talk to young people, I say, oh, I would have loved to study that, but everybody tells me there is no jobs, and, and even the people teaching those young people at the university say, oh, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. I mean, they've been doing it, but yeah. don't do that, don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> probably taking away their jobs. Uh, there is enough work out there. Actually, uh, in Austria and in Germany, the translation market has grown steadily over the past 10 or 15 years uh, in double digits every year. 
There will be major changes, I think, uh, in the interpreting market. There will be fewer big international conferences. Even the EU will have to cut down to a certain extent. But there will be more consecutive interpreting, and I really think there will be enough work. There is enough work. In 20 years, I've never had a single day where I was out of work. Uh, it's difficult to get into the market. It's only, I think, about 5% of the people who graduate from interpreting schools that actually work in that market. But some could be based on, on, on private reasons because they find it too stressful once they've actually done it. Or, uh, I don't know, it's like they have just taken different decisions. And it's true, it's a close-knit group. So this is why it's very important that uh, you try first, uh, now talking about how to get started, get a degree, because if everybody can do it, make sure that you're different from the others. Join professional associations that will give you some academic credentials in countries like Austria, that's very important. Uh, establish contacts with colleagues as soon as possible. I got my first jobs from people that I knew from my university who had graduated like three or four years earlier. They had gotten their first jobs, needed somebody, called me, and I uh, was allowed to work with them. I never ever got a job through a formal application. Uh, I wrote maybe hundreds of them, never ever was I invited to, uh, to a conference or to even submit a test translation. Uh, registration with online platforms for translators, interpreters, not to get jobs. They will offer you jobs as well, but only those who offer the lowest rates get the jobs. But it's very good to get some background information, again, to establish contacts with colleagues. You help each other out. I've got a difficult term. I don't know how to translate that. You can post your question there, and people will help you out. So that's something very useful. Okay, anecdotes. Uh, weren't you supposed to tell me that I'm late? And I know, I did this on my wrist, but... Uh, oh, you did this on your wrist. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, 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 okay. You, uh, we love you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All of you. Uh, <laughs> Not at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Do I have how many minutes? You've got minus ten. Minus ten. <laughs> okay. 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 No questions. Okay. By the way. Very, <laughs> very quickly. One of the most hilarious experiences. I went on a spaceship trip, and I didn't even know that it, they would be taking me there. Okay, I'll be very quick. I went to a conference. It was supposed to be a religion. I'm not a religious person myself, but I'm very interested in religion. So I thought, okay, I can do that. I went there. I opened the document. Hadn't really uh, received a document before that, and I went like, oh my god, what is this? Uh, it was not, ladies and gentlemen, blah blah blah, but it was like, your highness, your royalty, your god, whatever. It was some weird, I think sect, I don't even re I remember the name of it, it was at least 30 or 40, I don't even know how to call them, characters that they called gods, and it was like some people on, on, on some planets, so they actually invited you to go to, on to an intergalactic journey, and, and you have to interpret that with a lot of enthusiasm, right? Uh, and I went like, are the doors locked, do they have human sacrifice or whatever on that planet? Uh, and I actually did quite a good job, I guess, because afterwards one of those guys came to me and he went like, one hand on his chest, one on my chest, and went like, you know what? I know that was not you. And he's like, wow. <laughs> and the weird thing is that the person I had been interpreting, uh, sh he was a man, but he was then like transforming, like vocally or uh, into, uh, or verbally into a woman, which was kind of difficult for me to render properly. Uh, <laughs> But I did it with a lot of enthusiasm. And then I went like, I know, that was not you. That was her. That was her. <laughs> and I went like, when I came here, I didn't think of changing my sex. But uh, anyway, it was convincing. I got paid. I never went back there. Um, one of the most touching experiences, AMFPA, the Association of Mouth and Foot Painting Artists. Phenomenal people. Uh, you normally, most of you might know, are the Christmas cards that they paint. That's the kind of thing that they paint because that's what sells, that's what the organization wants them uh, to paint. But these people are true artists. It's unbelievable, unbelievable what these people do. And one of the most touching experiences was in Madrid. Uh, I mean, if, if you're lucky enough to be healthy and you go into a room and you have like 150 people who have suffered a lot in their lives, then it's just... Uh, yeah, just incredible what these people do. And I had like a nine or ten year old boy. He had no arms, he had no uh, 
legs and he was strapped to the wheelchair so that he would not fall off. Mm. And uh, he was an excellent painter. And it was amazing when you looked into the eyes of the child, uh, the, you know, that sparkling in the eyes when, when other people came, adults came and they marveled at, at his pieces of art. And, and that was a very, very touching and emotional movement. Uh, one of the saddest experiences, this uh, was one of the worst things I've ever experienced. At the World Congress of Parapsychology, they were talking about the treatment of psychological and emotional traumas. It was about uh, children soldiers, and they showed a video of a young boy who uh, told the uh, psychologists and psychiatrists what had happened to him. Uh, Soldiers, rebels came into his village, killed everybody. They made him watch how his parents got killed. Uh, they actually chopped them into pieces and they made a soup out of them. And they forced the child to eat that soup. Uh, and you hear that, you see that, and, and I was not prepared for that at all. I, I knew that I had been assigned to that working group, but we didn't, we were not given any material beforehand. And this is where you actually sometimes have to press a button and say, I'm sorry, I, I can't go on right now. I, you have to stop that video. I, I, need, I need 10 minutes or whatever. Terrible things. Uh, one of my happiest experiences, even though the background was a sad one, uh, a patient, a woman, she had come from Italy to Austria, supposedly uh, because the Austrian doctor was an expert in that field. And she was so scared that she would have like a, a very, very serious cancer, uh, like a killer, uh, basically. And her, she did not uh, suffer from that cancer. And being able to tell her that was like a total relief, of course. And, and, and a very, very happy moment, because that was one of the times where, where you actually get hugged by, by the person that you work for. And, and that was amazing as an experience as well. So why I love being a translator, interpreter, I love to help people communicate and to bridge gaps. And I'm sorry for being late, or having been late, or whatever. <laughs> Really, really interesting and funny and sad and just sort of evokes all of the emotions. I think um, it would be a shame to not let him have questions. Don't you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So we'll we'll take a few questions now and then. Obviously, lunchtime is a good sure, opportunity to ask me. to ask more. Anytime. But we'll definitely take a few now. And we're ten minutes behind, but hey ho. Only ten minutes. minutes? Huh? So um, front or back? You did. Any hands? Or <laughs> Okay, middle. <laughs> right. Hi. Hi. I would like to say thank you because I found this very really useful. Thank I you. study translation now at university and it okay. was really <laughs> inspiring. Great. And uh, you said that you didn't use uh, translator memories, but I, s I had a course now about one. It's called Trado Studio. Maybe okay. you know it. And uh, they sold me as, you know, the best and of course. whatever. <laughs> and I would like to ask if you know more or they are better one okay. than other. <laughs> We're not on American TV, so I guess I'm allowed to name some brands, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Tratus was one of the biggest, still is one of the biggest, was one of the first, personally. Uh, I never liked it. It was very, very complicated. Supposedly, they have improved it a lot. There is a Hungarian one I would like to uh, look into. It's called MemoQ. A lot of my colleagues use it. It's cheaper than Trados, and it supposedly works just as well. Some say even a lot better. There are other like WordFast, and I've never worked with that. You just have to try and, and, and try it out. See if it works for you. There are different things. There are tag systems. But I think that was like in the previous uh, versions. I think they don't use that kind of thing anymore. It all almost uh, always made my computer free, so I didn't like it at all. But I'm not very good with these things. Basically, if you do a lot of uh, text where you have a lot of, uh, um, you know, like sections that repeat themselves, are, that are repeated, then it might be a good idea to invest in that. But MemoQ is definitely something that you should look into. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, 
I'd like to, uh, to answer about Trados. I've used as the Trados 2009, and it's great. Okay. Uh, memory is a bit harder to work. Okay. It's similar to work across. Just one question. You said you never found any jobs through networks. No, sorry, Ben. I, I never found any jobs through applications, like applications. official applications here. You're registered in pros, right? Uh, yes, I haven't used it for many years, but yes, I'm still registered. Yeah, for me either, but I've uh, got a profile for like 10 years there, but I haven't found any jobs through pros because it's extremely chaotic, it's like half a million people there. Yes. And you post your language pairs and you just hope somebody sees your language. And there. they always go for the lowest rates. Yeah. So, any other networks besides pros? Are there, well, I use Prosecom to get advice from colleagues. That's what it's great for. If I have like a difficult term to translate, and I found some great colleagues are to interpret with, right? If I needed somebody uh, in my booth and I couldn't find anybody, uh, and you normally try to work with somebody you have been working with for many years. There is translators coffee, I, I guess you know that, and uh, there is. I don't really use them too often. I think. Actually, the best is prosy.com, uh, but not really to, to get jobs for it. But if you start out uh, as a newcomer, I, I think it's great to get a lot of background information. And there are some really helpful people out there. But don't try to get jobs there, because they only go for the lowest rates. Uh, I had a question. You said that uh, sometimes you're sworn in for for one day, yeah. um, but you're not a sworn translator. Yes. So uh, what is involved in becoming a sworn translator, and why aren't you one? Uh, okay, first of all, I don't like courts, <laughs> no matter which side I'm on. And uh, the thing is, uh, I think it's weird that they make you study like four or five years at a university and then they say, okay, you're not allowed to do any legal translations, which is ridiculous. So they actually are, came up with a special exam that you have to take. And you have, well, I don't know how long it takes, maybe half a year or a few months. It depends on the time that you invest into it. And then you have to take uh, an exam before a commission. The only thing I don't, uh, the only reason I don't do it is because I don't want to work in courts. And uh, I have a lot of work in, in other areas. It's, uh, you have to be the right person for that. They will, uh, the other thing is, they call it 2 o'clock in the morning because it was a traffic accident. They expect you to be there. I don't own a car. I don't want to drive. Uh, if I drove, I would be in court. And, uh, uh, yeah, so, I feel like it, I, I don't do any certified translations. Actually, I do the translation. I call my colleagues there, okay, read through it, and I get his stamp if he has checked it, right? Okay. Okay, just one more question and then we'll move on to the next presentation. Hello. Hello. I would like to know why do you learn slang or pop culture references? Because I can imagine it can be endless, like endless yes. what can people oh, yes. refer to. Oh, yes. So do you, as a joke, do you listen to hip hop or do you watch reality shows? It's not a joke, shows, I do. <laughs> or do you, I, I don't dance, dance so like hip hop, but I yeah. do listen to the. Or do you read like a huge amount of newspaper every day because you need yes. to know what they're referring to if it's I, political? I, I love. Or, thank you. The first, uh, thank you for your question. The first thing is that I, I do choose where I'm going to work. So if it's something that I'm not familiar with, I just don't accept the job. I don't do everything. Uh, and I'm mostly working with international organizations, so I do read the newspaper every day in several languages. You need to know, like they come up with different terms. The EU financial crisis has created a lot of new terms, right? You need to know them in these uh, languages that you want to work with. With the internet, that's no problem. You can do that on the train ride to the conference, basically, if you're quick enough. Uh, and I love watching sitcoms. So this is where you get all the colloquial stuff. Because uh, if you only work at conferences, you're going to sound kind of stiff. And uh, sometimes, you know, like you have small talk that you need to translate. They invite you to dinner. They never let you eat because they keep talking to each other, right? <laughs> uh, but you go like, yeah, right. How, how was meat? Great, if only I had time to eat it. Um, so... Yeah, but basically I just try to get into many different fields and if I'm not familiar with it, if I don't feel comfortable, I just say, sorry, I'm busy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for... <laughs>